tool by which the value of an idea, product, goods or services are globally estimated in the world we live today. Money has become a mainstay feature through which global affairs are largely determined. Essentially because it provides a system of value that influences the world's methods of evaluation. The history of money however spans the different eras in the development of commerce and industry, perfectly aligning with the growth of humans' business acumen. State Department, for the signing of the Bretton Monetary Now money didn't require any technological revolutions. Believing in money was just a mental shift, a new twist in reality that allows people to share in this story, this idea. The idea of a way to systematically value one thing in exchange for something else. Be that as it may, the instrumentality of money in global economics has become a phenomenon that influences the state of global affairs. Owing to the fact that the world's system of money as explicated historically stems from a salient concept of evaluating the worth of an entity solely based on the amount of money associated with it. This has invariably polarized the world into two strata of the poor and the rich. So, like coins, the idea of money has stratified the world into two sides. However, the rich and the poor can only be truly delineated by the condition of their hearts and circumstances of their lives. People are the same, irrespective of their condition. That is to say, the poor and the rich are exactly the same. Except there's a transformation in their hearts, in their lives. They are exactly the same. If a man is poor, he is no different when he becomes rich. Because there's no such thing as money. It exists in the mind of the poor. And the rich understand that. Money does not come from the government. It's a seemingly obvious question that's never asked or taught in schools for some reason. Unfortunately, most people's lives are basically dedicated to money. It's all people ever worry about or talk about. We go to school to learn basically how to go to university, to learn the skills to get a good job so that we can trade hours of our lives all for this thing called money. Henry Ford once said, it is well enough that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. With the establishing knowledge that money was a tool deployed to keep the poor limited in their minds, how then did the concept of money become entrenched in the world system? Let's go memory lane into the history of money. We use money every day. So it's this wonderful common ground. And the study of what's going on with money in the 18th century is fascinating. First human societies were operating largely along the principles of gift economy and debt. Here the gifts were not offered in exchange for money or other objects. Those who benefited from them were to return their service in the future. For example, if in a tribe someone had a bad hunting day, he will receive food from the other members of the tribe, provided he will do the same on good days. The barter system appeared much later. With barter, an individual possessing any surplus of value, such as a measure of grain, or a quantity of livestock could directly exchange it for something perceived to have similar value or utility. Bartering involves a lot of work. First of all, finding someone who's specifically interested in what you have and ensuring that you can both agree on a proper value for your transaction. This can be very impractical on execution as not always you'll find someone that needs what you have and maybe for that someone is not worth that much anyways. Bartering was most of the time practiced either between complete strangers or potential enemies. Humans began to use tally sticks made from animal bones to record and document numbers, quantities or even messages. The first traces of accounting have been found in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamian tribes traded for weapons while the Romans traded for salt. The Silk Road allowed for goods like fur, spices and gems 
to travel between the East and the West. These exchanges were happening all over the world. Objects that were small and hard to break, like cowrie shells or gold nuggets, helped to make transactions easier. So they started being used as currency. Money slowly became a placeholder for value. Over the years, it's taken on many forms, from coins to leather to paper. Of course, in order for people to want to use it, the currency had to be trusted or issued by an institution that was. This could be a trade guild, a bank, or a government. Otherwise, it, it would just be worthless. More recently, money is becoming something we often don't physically see or even hold in our hand. The world of payments and banking has largely gone digital. New types of currency continue to pop up, like cryptocurrency. So while money evolved from the likes of cowries into the paper money that we are very familiar with in this age and time, it has become astutely imperative to understand the origin of the world's monetary system, as it has remained largely de-emphasized for folks in these contemporary times. Especially bringing to limelight the history that surrounds the U.S. Federal Reserve and the central banks we have in different nations of the world today. The U.S. Federal Reserve, which is supposed to be or known as the central bank for the U.S., doesn't belong to the United States. After two failed attempts, a group of bankers wanted to put a central bank in the United States of America. It was December of 1910, and Senator Nelson Aldridge boarded a private train car in New York with six others. The six were not to be spotted by any news reporters to avoid questions. Their destination? Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. The meeting went for nine days, and from that, they created the Federal Reserve System. This is all documented and a matter of public record. Some of them went on to write about the meetings in their personal biographies. Here's a quote from Frank Vanderlip, president of the National City Bank of New York, February 9th, 1935, in the Saturday Evening Post. I was as secretive, indeed as furtive as any conspirator. Discovery we knew simply must not happen or else all our time and effort would be wasted. If it were to be exposed that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. The six men that Nelson Aldrich brought together included the head of banks, branches of government such as the Treasury, and some of the richest people on earth at the time. The bankers told the American public that the purpose of the system was to stabilize the economy and to stop the grip of the Wall Street banks over America. The problem was, the guys that wrote the bill were the very same people they said they'd stop. If they succeeded, it would give a small group of men the ability to create money from nothing and loan it to the American government with interest. So why was it done in secret? Because the American people didn't want a central bank. Back then, unlike today, people knew what central banks were and understood them very well. Everywhere a central bank went, there'll be wealth inequality, wild swings between economic booms and busts, and after each bust, those at the top of society mysteriously came out richer while everyone else got poorer. This invariably set the foundation of the world's monetary system on the paths of deceit, bringing to the fore the instrumentality of broad-scale deception that has become predominant in the world systems. The Federal Reserve was originally drafted as the Aldridge Bill, but when it came into Congress, they recognized Senator Aldridge's name and smelt a rat. The bankers needed better cover. They decided to send two millionaire friends to carry the bill to quell the suspicions of Congress and renamed it the Federal Reserve Act. Next, in a textbook lesson of deceit, the bankers set out to fool the American people through disinformation. In the newspapers of the day, the bankers screamed and protested against the new Federal Reserve Bill. It would ruin the banks, they exclaimed. The average person read the protesting articles of the bankers and thought to themselves, if the bankers hate it, it must be good. And then they ended up unknowingly supporting a Trojan horse. That's what you have with these, with these media houses that you're listening to. They come out with newspapers, they know they're lying. They don't believe what they're saying, they know they're lying. But you see, it's all about survival, survival of the weak. They want to live 
They need money. This insatiable urge for money is however not exclusive to the media industry. It permeates every strata of human existence in the society, albeit one of fundamental reasons the founding fathers of the world's banking system strategically ensured that the world operates on a single central banking model. For a lot of countries, the central bank is the country's central bank. It belongs to the country. It belongs to the people. It is the government that runs the central bank in many countries, not all of them. In fact, some countries have already lost their central bank and the people don't know it. The central banking model from the Bank of England and the United States has now been put in all countries and even consolidated power in parts of Europe as the European Central Bank, or ECB. This unites separate countries under one economic policy. The only places in the world that don't have central banks are North Korea, Iran and Cuba. In 2000, this list suspiciously included Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya. Since the end of World War II, the US dollar has been the reserve currency of the world. This means that all central banks hold US dollars in their reserves. In other words, all other currencies are backed by the US dollar. This conspicuously led to the predominance of one single currency recognized in the corridors of international commerce and industry, the dollar. When the post-World War II monetary system, called the Bretton Woods system, was created, all US dollars were backed by and exchangeable for gold. A byproduct of this was that currencies used to be very stable in relation to each other. Before that, all the countries, the exchange rates were fixed, and year after year you could predict what prices were going to be. You could start a business elsewhere, know if you were, you know, you could calculate profits. Business was much, much easier before floating exchange rates. The dollar is an ordinary paper that is backed only by propaganda. Uh, the statement that I just made is a very serious one, but it is true. It is not as good as most of your currencies in your various countries that are backed by something. The dollar is not backed by anything. In 1971, due to a falling US dollar, international capital flows into gold and the funding of the Vietnam War, President Nixon took the US dollar off the gold standard. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. Now the dollar was floating and backed by nothing and has been ever since. Okay, so let's think a little. If the US dollar is backed by nothing, but the world's reserves are backed by the US dollar, intrinsically, since 1971, doesn't this mean that all currencies are now backed by nothing tangible, only trust in the American government? So they understand exactly what, it's a game. It's a game. Well, in the last few years, many have be begun to understand what I said all the time. I said it's mere numbers. Now, with the cryptocurrencies of today, people are understanding more what I meant. It's all a game of numbers. Each time the bank makes a loan, the bank doesn't use other people's deposited money and give it to you. It creates new money. In modern times, this means typing digits into a computer. 97% of all money is digitally created like this. Only 3% is the physical cash and coins that we carry. Another crazy thing that commercial banks can do is lend out 10 times more money than they actually have in reserves. This is called fractional reserve lending. So who wrote this ridiculous system into law? For the United States, it was part of the Federal Reserve System drafted in 1913. And again, this is the same system used throughout the world. With a centralized monetary system, it becomes evidently conspicuous how the world is financially tilted in the same direction of debt-ridden economies. The need to understand how financial organizations instrumentalize debts and loans therefore becomes pertinent. Who set up the debt? They did in the first case. It creates debt. Let me explain. When you take out a loan, it's written down as an asset in the bank as a negative form, kind of like a negative value of money, or otherwise known as debt. Under this system, debt is actually money. And again, don't just listen to me. Mariner Eccles, former governor of the Federal Reserve states, quote, 
If there were no debts in our money system, there wouldn't be any money. So in essence, instead of gold being the backbone of our economy, it's now debt. The system we're under now is sometimes referred to as the debt-based monetary system. It requires that debt always grows. Countries and people must become deeper in debt so that there's more money in the system, because remember, debt is money. If people and governments stop borrowing money and pay back loans, the debt doesn't grow, the money supply shrinks, and the system falters. It truly is bizarre, but we all live in this system each and every day. In our day, money has also evolved to become a pivotal feature in the characterization and personality of individuals, groups, and organizations. In the world today, those who have accumulated a lot of money and hope to rule the world because they have the money. So with all of the foregoing, it becomes evident where the financial system of the world is heading for and therefore becomes essential to be abreast of the ominous interest of global financial organizations just as the history of money and the world's monetary system reveals the sinister motives of its founding fathers. The harsh realities of their strategy still permeates the world's current financial system which according to the scriptures it is doomed to fail. I read some of this to you in the Bible. How it was going to happen. And we are not yet in the period, in the era of the Antichrist, but we are in a period where there are Antichrist spirits. And this is one of the things I've been trying to get across to you. So if food is being rationed, you have money, but you can't buy more than they're going to give you. And they say, well, sorry, you can only take two eggs today. You and your family of six. Two eggs only. Oh, sorry, we can only give you one bottle of water today. Come back tomorrow. Then you think you can go to the bank. And because you have a, had a lot of money in the bank, you're going to get more? No, you can't. You come to the bank, oh, sorry, we can only afford you $100 today. Finish. You say 100 I need more than that. Oh, sorry. $100. Finish. Listen, it's here. That's what I've been reading to you. I've been trying to tell you to wake up and understand the times. Businesses and governments already use your spending data to assess you. Imagine if they knew how you spent every single cent. We could find ourselves in a social credit score society like the Chinese communists have. Is that what you want? You could find that insurance premiums might rise because of your diet or alcohol choices. And you could even find yourself cancelled because those in charge, the wokesters, deemed that you were supporting the wrong retailer. Little wonder a cashless society, a purely digital society, is beloved by big tech, big government and big business. But here's something that's a bit more alarming. If all your savings are digital, then you won't be able to avoid bank bail-ins or negative interest rates. A government could effectively confiscate a portion of your savings to bail out a bank. And believe me, they've done this. Just They did it in Cyprus. They took up to 10% of savers' balances in one night. So while the world and its systems may be heading for an ultimate brick wall, children of God must begin to live in the realities of the financial economy of our heavenly kingdom. Anybody ever ask you, do you have substance? Like, do you got money? So money talks, right? Substance. When they say he's a man of substance, they mean that he's he's loaded. He's he's got. He's a man of wealth, right? Now the Bible tells us what you need is faith. If you have the faith currency, you have it made. Faith is the substance. The substance for that unseen house, right? The substance, this is what you need in a world where they're trying to take away everything from you. There's something they cannot take from you. It's in your heart. Faith in your heart. This is the real currency. Didn't Jesus say it? He says, every good thing comes from the heart. 
You can produce all those things from your heart because you got faith. If they took away all the currency, if they took away all your money, you will still reproduce everything. Oh, glory to God. Yeah. So men and women of faith are unshakable because they have the real substance. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment.